So this evening, we're going to be going out of the book of uh, 1 Timothy, and we're going to go to chapter 3, and I want to um, go to verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at, um, last time we were looking at uh, how our faith matters, and we talked about how you and I, we have to stir up our faith. We have to stir it up. We have to go out. We have to pray for people. We have to stand on the promises of God, which are yes and amen. God gets all the glory, but we have to take steps and measures of faith inside of our life. And today, we're going to be not just looking at how faith matters, but we're going to be looking at how our conduct matters. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, how our conduct matters. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, First Timothy. How many of you love Jesus? How many of you give him all the glory, all the credit? Amen. And I'm so thankful that he opened doors for this building for us. Thank you, Jesus. Next Thursday night, we're going to be having service again. Next Sunday after Christmas, we're going to be having service again. I know some churches um, are not going to be having service. I was, I was praying about it. I said, you know what? I think it would be good if we just have service because, hey, he's, he's the reason for the season, right? Might have service, not like it's Christmas Day or anything. And uh, next Thursday, so we got to do our Christmas shopping next Wednesday for all you procrastinators out there. I know I'm a procrastinator. So Thursday, when the devil tells you, hey, go Christmas shopping, you're going to say, line devil, I already took care of it. And you're going to be here early, and we're going to fill this place up with our friends and our loved ones, right? So next Thursday, um, and if I don't see you, I know where you're at. You're watching online. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> all right, so uh, First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says this. The Bible says these words, it says, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Those who have served well. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how the people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the Inglesia. Uh, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Beyond all question, the mystery, of, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in flesh and was vindicated by the spirit and seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. Why don't we go ahead and pray tonight. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your goodness. Lord, we give you all the honor. And we give you all the glory. And right now, Lord, we pray right now that you would strengthen hearts, you would strengthen lives. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk into our destinies as we look at the book of 1 Timothy. Give us insight. Give us guidance. I pray also, Lord, that you would strengthen each and every person here. Fill us with your joy, your peace, supernatural Holy Ghost power upon our lives. Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you... Uh, would get all the credit and all the glory and all God's people said, amen and amen. So I'm in uh, chapter 3. I'm going to read a verse 2 as well. Uh, starting in verse 1. He says this. He says, I have a trustworthy saying, whoever is aspires, everyone say aspires, aspires to be an overseer, desires a noble task. Now you're looking at the word overseer with that overseer and your Bible might say a bishop. Uh, your Bible might say an elder. Uh, that's the same word that's used for pastor. So there's someone who is uh, someone who's leading, someone who's in a leadership position at a uh, in an iglesia, a church. There's someone who's in uh, someone who's in co not control, but someone who is guiding other people towards Jesus. Okay. So it says whoever aspires to do this. It is a noble task. It's a good thing. Like I remember when I wanted to be, I, I remember as a young boy, I wanted to be, I knew I, always, I want to be a pastor. And then when I was a teenager, I want to be a pastor. And then I, uh, as a young man, I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to, I had that, uh, that godly ambition, godly ambition and good, and amb there's good ambitions that God has given us. There's some good things that God has placed in our heart. Maybe you want to help people. Maybe you, maybe you, I believe there's pastors in here. I, I, that's what I personally believe. I know there is. I know there is. Um, there's, there's men, there's women of God who God is going to use your life in a tremendous way. I have no doubt. We're going to be sad to see you leave, but we're going to be glad because God's going to bring in two more couples in our church. And we're glad because God, he's going to fill this place up. You know what? When you let go of something good, God's going to give you something better. 
I'm just playing. You guys are, uh, pastors, they're going to be better. No, I'm just saying God is going to always provide. God's always going to provide. But I remember I was there and I was an usher in the, in the, in the Fresno church and I wanted to be a pastor. I remember one time a, a, my pastor was talking about being a pastor and I said, I want to be a pastor. I asked the question, I want to be a pastor. And you know what, I was young. I was probably like 21, 22 years old. 20, I forgot how young I was. But you know what, I remember some guys in the church started laughing at me. And I got, I got discouraged. They were laughing at me. They said, you being a pastor, oh, my gosh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. How many the devil always tells us, yeah, right. And I remember I left that parking lot so discouraged. I was like, man, I guess I don't got what it takes to be a pastor. I guess I don't got what it takes. And I remember I would be ushering outside, and I'd be there, and nobody would see me. But I, God knew my desire. I wanted to be a pastor. And I wanted to, to, to uh, go out there. And some days I'll be preaching to the cars. And th- that was the most quiet con- you know, congregation I ever had. But you know what? They listened. <laughs> they listened. And if you're watching, you have a desire. I don't know where you're watching from. If God has given you a desire of godly ambition, it's a good thing. The Bible says it's a good thing. The Bible says it's a noble thing. And I remember one day I was ushering. It was a Sunday morning. And I remember my pastor came up to me and said, hey, there's an opportunity for you to do a Bible study. And all of a sudden, that one little door opened up. And all of a sudden, I, took, I went to that Bible study, and there was elderly people there. There was no young people there. Uh, there was a young little girl. She was probably like five, four years old. But I remember I was over there at that Bible study. I was preaching to them like there were thousands of people. I was so excited because I was walking into my destiny. I was walking into my calling. I remember times there would be only one person. God always provided one person, uh, you know, to every Bible study. I was glad about that. But then God showed me that he wanted to do more and more and more and more. Then we went to Porterville, and God really broke me over there. God molded me over there. Me and my wife were there for seven years. We, we were there pastoring for seven years. Then we went to Visalia. We were there for three years. God did a lot of that. My desert was in Porterville. But all, to see the fruit now, and I know Sister Shalia, you're probably watching. I want to say we love you, Sister Shalia. Uh, Brother Dennis, we love you. Brother Felix, we love you. And there's still standing fruit there in Porterville that I know that me and my wife are part of. And at our one-year anniversary, it was so awesome to see Dennis and Shalia there in the front row. It was just saying, man, the fruit that God gives in our life. So me and my wife pioneered in, in uh, we were there pastoring in Porterville. Then we went to Visalia for three years. There's fruit there still standing. And then we went to Norwalk, and we're so blessed to be there in Norwalk, all that God did in our life and all that God molded us in and, and shaped us in and taught us there. And now when God called us here to Whittier last year, it's been such a blessing just to see that all God's doing inside of our life. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. And right now, I'm thinking about my future. I say, you know, God, I, I know what I want to do. I know what I want to do. I want to I wanna pastor go forward for you. As long as I'm healthy, as long as me and my wife are healthy, we're going to be pastors. We're going to do what God has called us to do. And when I get older, I, I have a vision of what I want to do when I get older. But it's all in God's hands. See, God can do whatever he wants. It's all in God's hands. But ambition is good. One man, he said this about ambition He said, Christian contentment is the the direct fruit from having no higher ambition than belonging to the Lord and to be totally at his disposal and the place he appoints. And let me say this, the place he appoints, he will anoint. Whatever place he's going to appoint you, he's going to anoint you. At the time he chooses what the provision he pleases to make. See, God is going to give you, bring you to that place. He's going to provide. He's going to provide provision for the vision. You're going to see that right there. But my encouragement to you is don't try to bust a door down that God hasn't opened. Let him elevate you. And a lot of times he'll elevate you when it doesn't look like there's no elevation coming. Um, it's, it's, it's something that is supernatural. See, the call of God is supernatural. And you're going to see him open doors in a supernatural way. So um, I'm thankful for the fivefold ministry that we see operating in the church of God. And one of the operations of this fivefold ministry is a pastor, a shepherd, overseer. And this is what Paul's uh, talking to Timothy about. He, he gives him guidelines, a blueprint, so you and I can have uh, some type of structure. There's a structure that God has given us so things won't get out of hand. So 
let me give you an example for this. If someone desires to be a teacher of God, uh, the best way I can describe it is this. I used to, be, I used to take my kids to jujitsu, and there was black bouts there. And the black bouts were there. They were teaching the kids. It was really awesome just to see them teaching the kids the fundamentals and then also the, the intricate things of jujitsu. But what gave him the quality, uh, the, 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 um, the authority to teach was what he knew, his skills. Now, if my son went over there and he beat that guy up and he, he got that guy in a triangle choke and he won the, the teacher, all of a sudden it would be like, how is this guy qualified? He doesn't even know what he's doing. Now, God has given men and women uh, of God, he's given us a certain mandate of conduct to follow so you and I can be counted worthy of being able to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not anyone can teach um, because their lifestyle has to match up with what they are teaching. Okay, so we're going to go here. And uh, the Bible says this. It says, now an overseer, in verse 2, it says, now overseer must be above reproach, faithful to his wife. Is there any sisters here? I'm, you know Pastor Danny's flirting with you. I want you to stand up right now. The Bible says, faithful to his wife. The Bible says, temperate, self-controlled. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> faithful to his wife. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to go over these really quick. The first one is above reproach. Some of you are saying, Pastor Danny, man, I can't be a pastor. I've done way too many things. I've, done, I've been involved in way too many uh, terrible things before I knew the Lord. Let me say this. The, the devil will use that, uh, get, try to use that to discourage us from going forward. Everyone has a past. But is your past under the blood of Jesus? Have you accepted his forgiveness? Everything that was before, before Christ, B.C., I want to tell you that's under the blood of Jesus. When the devil comes with all those things and says you're not above reproach. Remember what you did before you were saved? Remember what you did? You know what? That's under the blood of Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has forgiven us. God has wiped all those sins away. God has, has brought us to that place of, of repentance and forgiveness. And, and you and I, even today, even if you've done things after you were saved, but you confessed them, and you've, I want to say you're forgiven. You're forgiven. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? So above reproach is something that is, it's a legal term that means that they can bring a charge against you. Now, if we are saved and we're living for God, let me say this. The devil can't bring no charges against us. He's an accuser and he tries to bring those charges against us. But the good thing is this, is that there is no charge against the, the, uh, a Christian believer. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, is, it, it covers all that. It covers all of those sins. But if you're here today and you, you have uh, something against your brother... Are you, is there something that's going on in your life that you know is not right? You're not living above reproach. If you're here today and you owe somebody $500 and you're avoiding that brother every time you see me, you're walking the other way. Or maybe you promise, I'll paint your house, I'll do all three rooms, and you only did one and a half rooms. You know, you're not living above reproach because when you're living above reproach, you're keeping your word. You're keeping your word and your word it carries weight when you're living above reproach. What you're going to do with your brother or your sister in Christ is you're going to get it right. Turn to your neighbor and say, get it right. Get it right. You know, let me give you an example. I remember one time I was preaching, and, man, the, the, the message, it, it, man, it, was, it went so bad. It was so terrible. You're saying, Pastor, you're talking about last week? <laughs> no, it was, it was bad. It was just, oh, my gosh. I couldn't. But you know what was wrong? Me and my wife, we were in conflict. So I came up here and I tried, it wasn't here, but I went and tried to preach. But me and my wife, my wife was not upset with me about something. It was, it was something that I should have took care of. It was my fault. And God showed me something that you have to have your relationships in order if you're going to come up here and minister. You can't be in bitterness. You can't be in anger. Why? Because the Bible says if you have a gift, before you even take your gift to the altar, be reconciled with your brother. Be reconciled with your sister in Christ. Why? Because it affects what we do. You and I, we can't fake the funk up here. We can't fake it to make it up here. You and I, we have to stand before the Lord humbly 
And we have to stand before the Lord faithfully. And we have to stand before the Lord in, in total humility, you know, just total humility and, and allow God to uh, use us for his honor and his glory. The Bible says he must be temperate. That means not given to extremes. That means someone who's not given to extremes, like, you know what, they're on, uh, you know, just uh, on social media, like, for 10 hours. They're not, they're, they're not just uh, at the gym for 20 hours. There's some type of balance in their life. Um, the Bible says they must be self-controlled, respectable. That means that we're respecting one another. That means that you and I talk to each other with respect. No matter how long we've been saved or what our position is, that you and I, that we talk to each other with respect. Now, this is important, that if you and I are going to see those things that God wants, we're going to have to treat each and every one of us with respect. The Bible says not only respectable, but hospitable. That means opening up your house, allowing people to come in your house, having Bible studies, having fellowship, that your house becomes a hospital. Your house is a hospital where people are able to come and you're able to minister to their life. Some of you are saying right now, man, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want people over my house. Well, you know what? Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everyone's called. And God will show you. God will minister to you. Uh, God won't show me. He's going to show you. He's going to show you. He's going to minister to your life. But I believe in this place there's pastors. I believe in this place there's pastors' wives. And don't get into a place, we can never, and for those who are watching online, never get into a place where you think, man, I'll be fulfilled when I'm a pastor. No, be fulfilled now. Be fulfilled now. Be, why? Because a lot of times we think, oh, once I get that position, I'm going to be fulfilled. No, it's not, it doesn't work like that. Be fulfilled and content in God right now. And so some of you are saying, well, pastor, I'm not going to be a pastor. Why are you preaching about this? So you can know what a pastor is supposed to look like. So you can say, pastor, you preached about that. But you haven't been respecting me the way you need to. So you can see uh, what a pastor, an elder, a bishop, and even a deacon is supposed to look like. The Bible says this, that they're temperate, they're self-controlled, they're respectable, they're hospitable, they're able to teach. Not given to drunkenness. Um, not given to drunkenness. Today, we live in a day and age where there's so many people given to substance and and you and I, as, as, as Christians, I believe this is not just for pastors, this is for all believers. That you're not drinking, you're not, you're not smoking no more, you're not, you're not drink, drinking, uh, you know, uh, you're not on those vapes or those, cart you know, those cartridges now that they have. You let go of all those things. Just let them go. And if you're here tonight and you've, you've been involved in that stuff, I want to encourage you. You know what, God wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. God wants to fill you. You say, well, Pastor Danny, when's God going to fill me? You know what I want you to do? I want you to go home and say, God, fill me. Fill me. And you know what he'll do? He'll fill you. He will fill you. He will fill you, and you'll be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Recently, we went, to, uh, we went out to you with uh, some awesome couples here at our church. We were there eating, and the guy said, hey, you guys want some drinks? And he looked all happy. You guys want some this and that? And I said, man, we're drunk in the Holy Spirit. He looked at me like he was a backslider, like he knew exactly what I was talking about. You know what, I don't need no alcohol to make me happy. I don't, I don't, need, I don't need no, um, uh, no uh, marble cigarettes to, to relieve my stress. All I need is to get alone with Jesus and say, Jesus, help me. Fill me. Heal me. Strengthen me. I'm encouraging some of you to go home and just do that. Right there in your home. You know what, God, he'll invade your home. That's one thing that we're learning, man, God will invade your home more and more. Jesus will fill you, amen, and help you. So you're here today and you're battling with this. You know what, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to get you and say, man, you know what, you're just so bad. And I, you know what, I'm not here to do any of that. Why? Because I was once bound by that. I mean bound. It had a stronghold in my life. But you know what, I'm here to encourage you that God can break any chain. And fill you with true joy, true peace, true fulfillment, true happiness. Man, God's going to baptize some of you in the Holy Spirit. You're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And once you get filled with that living water, you never want to go back. But you know what? For those who have been saved for a while and you're dry, you know what? Get a refill of the Lord. Say, Lord, refill me. Fill me up, God. Fill me with that Holy Ghost power and anointing. 
We need the Holy Ghost Church. You know what? We're not going to be a religious church. We can't be a religious church. Why can't we be a religious church? Because religion is dead. It is dead. It's, it becomes, man, we become man pleasers. When you and I are full of the Holy Ghost, man, you and I, we have the joy of the Lord. Does that mean we don't get attacked? No, we get attacked. But you know what? God will give us the victory over every attack that we're in. See, some of you are saying, I don't want to get attacked, so I don't want to get filled. No, you know what? You're a fighter. You're a fighter. Don't be a wimpy Christian. Don't be on fire for the Lord. Be on fire for the Lord. You know what? God has already won the battle. And we're in a good fight. So the Bible says this. Um, the Bible says not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. Now that's important because there's, when, when there's, you're going to be uh, uh, involved in ministry, there's going to be, uh, the, the enemy is going to send things your way. He's going to send a job your way. He's going to send finances your way. And you know what he's going to do? You're going to come to the point where it's either you're going you're gonna to choose the finances or choose your destiny in God. The devil will come with the gold. And he'll put the gold right in front of you. And he'll say, hey, I will give you $100 an hour if you get this job that pulls you out of church. I'll give you this job. In Pennsylvania, for $500,000 a, a year, and, but it's going to pull you out of your destiny. See, I've seen that. We've witnessed that. And you know what? That has even came my way, where there was all kinds of money. I had an opportunity for all kinds of money. Before, when I was pastoring there, in Vis uh, we were in Visalia at the time, and there was all kinds of money. But you know what? I would have given up on being a pastor. So I had that choice. Go with the money, go with the new house in a, in a different city and, 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 you know, work, 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 have all those nice, nice things. Um, and I'm not to say that you're never going to have nice things because God's going to bless you. God's going to bless your life. I'm not saying that you, because you're a pastor you're going to have to take the vow of poverty. That's not what I'm saying. God's going to bless you. God's going to give you, God's going to bring increase. God's going to bring strength your way, power, you know, supernatural uh, things your way. But what I'm saying is this, there are going to be opportunities. God's going to send, uh, God's going to send resources your way. But the devil's going to send gold your way. He's going to send girls your way. He's going to send glory your way. When all of a sudden you begin to get proud of the way God's using you, you start getting proud of it. God starts elevating you, and all of a sudden the devil's going to come and say, man, look at what you're doing. Man, you're a good preacher. Man, the way, and then people are going to come to you and say, man, that was so good. Oh, my gosh, it really changed my life. And you're going to go home. You're going to be driving. I'm like, oh, man, thank you. Oh, God. Oh, my. you're going to think you're God's gift to humanity. You're going to be like, oh, man, I'm like, I'm like the Mexican Joe Osteen. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, you know, just try and. And the devil, you're going to start thinking, oh, I'm the best preacher, I'm the best, and man, what would the church do without me, and man, what would God do without me? Help us, Lord. I'm just trying to prepare you. I'm just trying to help you. And he's going to send that job your way. He's going to send girls your way. He's going to send glory your way. And what are we going to do? Can I encourage you? If there's a true call of God on your life, God's going to humble you. And it's not fun. I've had it done to me. But God does that to keep us on the destiny he has for us. He does that. Um, but, but you're in that point where the, the enemy will come. It will be lying to you. But in that moment, you know what you need to do? You know what I need to do? We, we need to give glory to God. And God will use your wife to humble you. God will use men in, of God to humble you. God will use circumstances to humble us and bring us to that place of total humility. Um, so when that comes your way, let me encourage you to allow the Lord to help you, okay? The Bible says this. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And must uh, do it in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, 
or he may fall, become conceited and fall into the same judgment as the devil. He must also have good reputation with outsiders so they would not fall into the disgrace and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, dinkies are to be worthy of full respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of faith with a clear conscience and must be first be tested. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you got to get tested. Tested. Test is going to come in our life. There's going to be tests where you feel like nobody cares. There's going to be tests where you feel like God doesn't see. There's going to be tests where it feels like, uh, man, I'm all alone. There's going to be tests where it feels like, man, I don't, I'm not seeing no breakthrough. There's going to be a test. One of the hardest tests that you're going to go through uh, in this is, is the test where your dream is dead. And this is important. I want you to listen to this part. There's going to be a time where you have this dream to be a pastor, but there's going to be a moment in that journey. Listen to me. Uh, those who are watching online, please listen to me. This is important. Very important. There's going to be a moment where there's going to be circumstances where it looks dead. And there's no way that it's going to change. And in that, spot, in that moment, you're going to want to quit because you're like, my dream's dead. I'm never going to walk into my destiny. I'm never going to walk into my destiny. I'm never going to walk into my destiny. But it's, it's that God's putting you in that place to see, will you still serve me even if I don't give you that position? Will you still serve me even if you don't be a pastor? You don't be that ministry leader. You don't get that position. Will you still serve me? Now, my encouragement is just take it one day at a time and keep your eyes on Jesus. Why am I saying this, church? I'm saying this because you're going to go through that. God's going to put you in that place. But in that place, he's going to say, am I worth you loving me even if you don't see what you want? And he always is worth loving, even if we don't see what we want. Always worth loving. You know what? You know what's keeping me saved? It's not being a pastor. It's being in love with Jesus. It's being in love with Jesus. And you know what? If God had did something in my life, me and my wife, if God had done something in my life where he, in, in, in uh, the future, whatever he has, because I know I'm not always going to be a pastor. I want to be a chaplain someday. And... Um, I know that the way God orchestrates it, I'm going to be excited about that. I'm going to be so excited about that. I know that someday God is going to do something like that. I, I just don't know when. I want to be in a prison someday there ministering to people there. And I wanna, that's what I want to do. That's, that's, that's the thing that God, I believe God has placed on my heart. But I know he has a future for me to be a pastor. But whenever that changes, he's going to confirm it. And he's going to show me, hey, this is the direction that I'm going to be taking you. My dream is to do that after in my 50s. That's my dream. My dream is to be a pastor here for 15 years at least to be here. I want to see us get a building, pay off that building. I want to see your family get saved. I want to see God do all those things. But my life is in God's hands. There's no guarantees. I just want to be in the will of God. And you know what? I don't want you ever to... Make me an idol in your life. You need to serve Jesus because Jesus is Jesus. We can't make pastors idols. We can't make uh, uh, pastors idols. Why? Because when we do, when, when, when they move and or the Lord takes them home, we're, we're like, I don't even want to serve Jesus no more. No, you got to serve Jesus because Jesus is Jesus. If you leave, I'm going to be honest right now. If you leave, I'm going to be sad. But I'm going to still serve Jesus. <laughs> I'll be sad. I might shed a tear for you. But you're, you're not holding me up. <laughs> and I shouldn't be holding you up. Jesus should. Don't ask for my autograph after church. <laughs> I'm just a man just like you guys. My wife's just a woman just like you sisters here in the Lord. Get your eyes off a of man. Get our eyes on Jesus. Lord, I want to serve you. So now deacons and bishops, a lot of people say, well, what's the difference between an elder? What's the difference between a deacon? Now deacons were first mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 2, where Peter and John and James, they came with this problem. The, the, Jew, the Jewish widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And all of a sudden, P 
Peter is being drawn to this place, and they're saying, hey, there's not enough food here. And Peter's in a place, well, hey, I got to go study for tonight's sermon. I got to go pray for revival. I got to go fast, and I'm being drawn to this place. He goes, you know what, guys, let's think of a, a solution to this. You know, good leaders always find solutions to problems. They look for them. They look for solutions. So they find solutions. So they come back, and they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to appoint seven men who are... Uh, you know, they have a good reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit, and they began to choose these men, and these men were the ones who overseen the daily distribution, and the word that's used for deacon, this is where the text is, this is the book, in, book of Acts chapter 6 verse 2, and this is the same, uh, text, same word in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, the word for deacon. Now, the only difference between an elder and a deacon is this, is that elders have to be able to teach. Deacons, they don't have to be able to teach, but every other standard of godliness is the, is the same for a deacon. Deacons, they serve. Deacons, they serve. They serve. It's not that they're behind a pulpit. They're not behind, you know, they're not on, behind a megaphone. They are ready to serve. They are ready to serve. But the Bible says that there's certain standards. One of them, the standards that we see for a deacon is this. It says in verse not, uh, 8, it says, In the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect. Everyone say Respect sincere. And the Bible says this in verse 11. This is really good, but this applies also to elders and bishops. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers. Not malicious talkers. Now, how many of us know in church, there's always gossip? There is some drama in church. Oh my gosh, there is some drama in church. Like every, you know what, there's drama almost every week in church. But it's very important that what do we do? We take it to prayer, and we're praying for the situation. But if it involves something that's serious, you're going to take it to leadership so they can pray, and they can, they can get a hold of God, and they can, something can be done to rem remedy the situation. But one of the things that the enemy will use is he use gossip. Gossiping about, you know, oh, man, did you hear about what they're going through? Oh, did you, oh, did you hear about her son? Oh, did you hear about her daughter? Oh, did you hear about, oh, man, oh, my gosh, really? They talk like that? Oh, my gosh, your kids talk like that to them? Oh, my gosh. And you're talking about a different church that's not even our church. You're, you're talking about, you're just, did you hear about that pastor? Oh, my gosh. And, you know, let me say this. We have to be careful. And I don't even know why I'm saying this. I don't even know why I have the phone on me. Maybe you're, <laughs> I don't even know why we're saying this. Can I be honest with you? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be totally, I, man, gossip, that was one thing that wants to attack me all the time. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. But what happened, well, you have to be careful, especially when kids are involved, because you don't want your kid to get bitter. You don't want, we don't want our kids to get bitter. We have to be careful, especially if we're leaders. If we're leaders, our leadership that's one, of the, that's one of the things that keeps us in that place of leadership is that you and I were careful with the information that comes our way. That we're not like, oh, you know what, I'm going to call this sister and tell her what this sister did. Oh, did you hear? Oh, my gosh, did you hear? Oh, my God. But you and I say, you know what, right now I'm going to be a shield for my sister. I'm going to pray for my sister. I'm going to pray that God strengthen her, bless her, keep her, and help her. And you know what? You and I have to be careful that we don't turn the prayer chain into the gossip chain. Oh, I want to pray for this. I want to. I want to pray for this. We have to be careful. So if if you're here today and you have that desire to be a pastor, make sure that you and your wife are on the same page about gossip. That you don't you don't gossip. You don't. Even with your teams, uh, praise God. Amen. I got an amen right now. The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes, he would declare praise. Out of the mouth of babes. And tonight, when gossip comes our way, as leaders, let's not inv get involved in gossip. As the worship team makes their way up here, the Bible says in Timothy that these, this is the conduct that matters for leaders. Next Thursday night, after all your Christmas shopping is done, I know you'll be here. I know you'll be here. 
I know you're going to invite somebody out. I know you're going to go Christmas shopping this weekend and get it all taken care of. But next Thursday night, we're going to be looking at what God calls for young men and young women. And I was, as I was hearing uh, our, at our, at our um, vision night, as I was hearing the generations, I kept on hearing uh, generations wanting to impart into the younger generation. And I was so blessed by that. I'm so blessed because our younger adults, they respect the older adults. And I'm so blessed that the older adults here, they love and respect the younger adults here. Because we can't do it without either one. We can't do it without either one. And the enemy wants to divide that. He wants to bring a division. But you know, just like you parents need your kids, the kids need the parents. They need them. Let me give you an example. When you were born, aren't you thankful your mom was there? Changing your diaper and feeding you and being there for you by your side, there all the time. I'm so blessed by one of the couples here in our church, Sister Paula Cobian. Her parents are getting older. You know what? She's there with them. She's feeding them. She's caring for them. I'm blessed by Brother Steve and Sister Rose. Same thing. She's there for her mother. She's there feeding her family, caring for them. Why? Because we need each other. We need each other. And tonight, the younger generation needs the older generation. And the older generation, yes, you need the younger generation too. That's why we're one body for the glory and honor of God. This evening, tonight, with every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to God, you're here tonight. You're here tonight. And you're not saved, or maybe you're watching online, you're not saved, you're not serving the Lord. And you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the best decision you could ever make. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. That's the greatest decision you could ever make. I'm, I am telling you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. And if you're there today and you want to accept the Lord right where you're at, when no one looking around, just raise your hand up right where you're at. Say, yes, I would like to accept Christ in my life. I want my sins forgiven. Just raise your hand up right where you're at. Or you're watching online. Maybe you're there at your home with your family. We want to pray with you. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord, I repent of all my sins. I believe that you died and that you rose again on the third day. From this day forward, my life is yours. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. If you said that prayer, we're so blessed that you said that prayer. But we want to give you more help, more encouragement. We want to see God do that wonderful work inside of your life. If you can let us know in the comments, and we want to pray for you. We want to see God disciple you and make you into that believer and Christian that he's called you to be. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. If we could all stand in this place, thank you, Jesus. And tonight, the call tonight is uh, a call just for encouragement, a call for strength, a call for maybe you have unsaved loved one. Maybe you're, you need a miracle. Someone you love needs a miracle. Or maybe today some part or portion of the message encouraged you are strengthened you, are convicted you. What we want to do today is we want to open up this altar and we want to pray with you. The altar is open.